I don't know if we said in our Rangers versus Lightning post game video that we were going to talk about this, but you know me. We gotta talk about this. There was no way this topic was going to go under the radar without us discussing it on the channel at least a few times, because as more articles and more conversations get started about this thing, you know, it's easier for us to talk about it as the storylines progress. But today we're talking about another top fin taken in one of these recent NHL entry drafts who would happen to have been scratched against the Tampa Bay Lightning. One year ago was a fantastic Finn who went third overall who has an acronym nickname of KK. He was a guy playing for the Montreal Canadiens and he was scratched for the Stanley Cup Finals or for part of the Stanley Cup Finals against the Lightning. This year, it's another top Finn, second overall, 2019. His initials are also KK and this guy's playing for the Blue Shirts in New York. We're talking about Capo Caco, a guy who was not playing when the Rangers got eliminated by the Lightning in the third round Eastern Conference Finals in game number six. Now, I want to go over just the story of how everything came to be this way, and then we're going to explore what NHL analysts and media and writers are saying about Capo Caco, because this entire story, I feel like it's only really beginning, and as the days progress, we might see more conversations that open the doors to all the possibilities here. So, for Capocaco, the guy's 21 years old, 6'3", 205, we have a big idea as to what he is as a hockey player. He's a pretty physical guy, he can skate, he can also play well, it's just, he was a second overall pick back in 2019, who was an absolute game changer in TPS in the Liga, who had never really been that same game changer at the NHL level. This season in 21-22, Kako had 18 points in 43 games played. Not the best in the world, not the worst in the world, but for a guy who was coming off of the end of his first entry-level deal, this was a pretty significant season because, okay, you have a few options here by the time 21-22 ends up. You could either re-sign Kako to a contract, you could let him go for an offer sheet, somebody signs him, and then he gets sent over for compensation, or you could just trade him straight up. There's a few ideas here that the Rangers could explore, but of course, you know, he's a second overall pick who was a pretty highly touted prospect in 2019 so you probably don't want to go out there and trade this guy away he also had five points in 19 games in the playoffs with the rangers he was a part of that kid line with alexi lafreniere and philip Cheadle. that line that single-handedly it seems won the rangers a few games throughout this postseason and had a good chunk of the spotlight focused on them for certain parts of the run now, as you all know, in Game 6 against the Tampa Bay Lightning, we were all kind of debated because during the New York Rangers pre-game rushes for that game, Capo Caco was actually skating with Artemi Panarin and Andrew Kopp. But by the time the actual game rolled around, you saw Capo Caco get scratched and you saw Ryan Strom enter the lineup instead. Ryan Strom, by the way, injured. Sure, he could play, quote-unquote, could, but he wasn't able to play at his best capacity, not nearly in the slightest. You could definitely notice that the guy was hurt. And so for Capo Caco getting scratched in Game 6, you had a huge reaction from a lot of Rangers fans and a lot of Rangers media. This is what Joe Fortunato had to say. Strom literally cannot skate. Win or lose, why he played tonight over Capo Caco, or at all, has to be asked until Gerard Gallant answers it. We also had this perspective that was brought up, too, by Greg Rosinski. It's amazing how he went from building statues for the kid line this postseason to Kako wouldn't have made a difference, so you don't have to ask about scratching him, you evil media people. The reason Greg is saying this is because in the postgame availability for Gerard Gallant, when the game was over, they asked him, hey, what was the deal about scratching Capo Caco? Why'd you do that? Yada, yada, yada. And Gerard Gallant said, I'm not going to talk about it. Tonight's not the time. Now, for me personally, I kind of don't like the idea that a coach scratches a player. He lives with that decision. He plays another guy who is very clearly hurt. And then in the media, after they lose, he goes out there and refuses to answer questions as to why he made the decision that he did. That's kind of the point of post-media game press conferences, right? I don't know what Gerard Gallant is trying to pull here by saying, oh, it's not the time to answer why I scratch Capo Caco, but it certainly isn't making anything feel better. 
This is what Vince McCargliano said about the entire thing before the game actually began. So this is before they lost. One more thought on Capo Caco playing before my attention fully shifts to the game. I get that Gerard Gallant is solely focused on trying to win tonight. But from a big picture perspective, scratching the second overall pick from a few years ago is not a great way to signal belief in him. We also had this article published by Larry Brooks on the New York Post. Puzzling Capo Caco scratch clouds his Rangers' future. The beginning of this article opens up with the entire Yasperi caught Kanyemi thing. Hey, guess what? One year ago, the Hab scratch pending RFA caught Kanyemi, a Finn whom they had selected third overall in 2018 for games four and five, the final two games of the Cup Finals against Tampa Bay. Kot Kinyemi then signed an offer sheet with the Carolina Hurricanes. Then the whole thing happened, which you're definitely aware of because we've chronicled it on this YouTube channel for a long time. There was, of course, a certain amount of payback involved in the Canes' ownership decision to target KK, but an equally large part is that KK was susceptible to an offer sheet and more than willing to be seduced. Now, on to current events, the Rangers scratch pending RFA Capo Caco, and where it goes from here is anyone's guess. But if Caco indicates a willingness to receive suitors once the market opens on July 13th, one would have to believe Saturday night would certainly be a significant factor in his decision. Brooks calls out the idea to let Dryden Hunt play on the fourth line and not have Capo Caco in the lineup, and he also talks about how Gallant never truly bought into the concept of the Lafreniere Cheadle Caco line, the kid line. He never really trusted them, despite their contributions to the team. He then calls it out that the fact that Dryden Hunt was playing instead of Capo Caco is indeed somewhat of a message. He then says that the contract negotiations with Kako were always going to be interesting because the Finn was always going to have leverage. Even if coming off a year ruined by a wrist injury that sidelined him for a few games, there still is that mathematical truth that the Rangers would be helpless if Kako receives an offer sheet in the range of 4.2 million to 6.3 million that would bring with it nothing more than the Kotkaniemi compensation of a first and a third rounder. With second contracts due to both Lafreniere and Keandre Miller in another year that would likely amount to upwards of a combined $10 million in cap space, the Blue Shirts hierarchy would not be able to match any offer sheet that is worth Capo Caco to be signing. The ramifications of Saturday scratching are unknown, but if Caco gets to July 13th without an extension that would likely be a two-year bridge deal for between $2 million and two point five per, then we'll have a pretty decent idea of what the winger made of this entire situation. If it gets to July 13, you can probably replace the number 24 on his back with the for sale sign. By the way, once it becomes inevitable that Kako is going to July 13, it will be incumbent for GM Chris Drury to trade Kako for a more immediate return as opposed to getting that compensation. They cannot be caught Kanyemid. Kako's development has been much slower and is ceiling much lower than anticipated when the Blue Shirts danced the jig upon selecting him second overall, but there has been progress. Now this, though? And this article will be linked in the description if you want to go ahead and read it, but man, Larry Brooks goes in on the situation and says pretty much that because of what happened tonight, or not tonight, but a few days ago, you get what I mean, Capo Caco's already uncertain leverage-based contract negotiations are going to be even more interesting because of how Caco himself feels about the situation. Not playing in an elimination game over Dryden Hunt, over Ryan Strom, who isn't able to play. You are going out there, working your tail end off, winning board battles in the offensive zone, digging pucks out and feeding it back to your very competent teammates in Lafreniere and Cheadle, and the coach goes out there and scratches you for the final game when you guys end up losing and you're eliminated from the playoffs. It's caught Kanyemi all over again? Who knows? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below about the entire Kako caught Kanyemi conversation here. It's just so funny to me that it's a back to back yearly thing. Caught Kanyemi, top pick in 2018. He signs a three year deal. He gets traded in 20, or not traded, he gets compensated and offer sheeted in 2021. And then Capo Kako, drafted in 2019 as a top pick, is having the same conversation happen to him because he was also scratched by his team deep in the postseason against the Lightning, wherein his team lost. And now it's 2022. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you're a fan of any other team, do you want your team to sign Capo Kako to an offer sheet or do you want to trade for this guy? If you're a Ranger, Rangers fan, what do you think is the next move here? I know a lot of Rangers fans have been saying on my timeline especially, we gotta keep this guy. Like, he's still so young, it's tough to justify the idea of giving up on him so early, but this idea that Larry Brooks is bringing up is so 
cohesive to me. It makes a lot of sense when it comes to the money and whether or not he actually would sign a four million something dollar offer sheet and whether or not that would actually be worth it for the Rangers to match and... Yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. And bye.